Welcome to this reflection video for St Peter and St Paul's Church of Encanton and St Michael's Pensel Wood. This will be thinking about the reading set for Trinity 3 and particularly the gospel reading about the stilling of the storm. So let's still our souls now as we prepare to begin. I'm going to pray the collect now for this Sunday. Let us pray. God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast to your promises of peace, run for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before you listen to the reflection, I'm going to suggest that you listen to the hymn Will Your Anchor Hold, performed by Ely Cathedral Choir. The link is there, but also you'll find it on the email you may have used to get to this link. So please listen to this, this hymn first. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I do hope that you've listened to that hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold? Because it plays into the themes I'm going to talk about today. It's quite a big favourite of mine. I have many favourite hymns, though it's not a very Anglican one. I only came across it during my training for the ministry in Wales. And I believe it's regularly sung by the Boys Brigade. It's a great one for a crowd singing enthusiastically, as it's not the kind of hymn to sing quietly, but with gusto and some passion. This hymn points to the bigger picture, the context of our life in the storms of life, and the reality that in Jesus we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure as the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. As it is living in stormy times that I'm going to talk about today, sometimes in life there is a clear path and an obvious objective to aim for. Things seem certain and well-ordered and inspiring. Basically, all is well with our world. And yet at other times it seems like life is very confused, messy and difficult with meaningless running in round in circles, lots of frustrations and pain and more questions than answers. We do seem to have had a lot of this in recent times. For me, the gospel reading we heard earlier speaks into the messy, confused and difficult side of all our lives, with its tales of storms and the fishermen disciples. In the face of that storm, the disciples were not at all sure what to do. Suddenly, very fearful, and at sixes and sevens. They literally move from the relative calm to a great commotion. And much as we might wish it to be otherwise, the truth is that we all have stormy times, messy, confusing times like this, which come upon us without warning, sometimes caused by something trivial and short-lived, and at other times caused by events that feel like our whole world has fallen apart. 
Do they want us to dig a little more deeply into this story of the disciples in the storm in the context of the storminess and the messiness of our lives and see what we can learn from it? The storms on the Sea of Galilee were well known to the fishermen, the fishermen that Jesus had chosen to be his disciples. These storms were an unwanted and scary part of life. They were infamous rather than famous. No doubt the disciples knew of other fishermen or even members of their own families who had lost their lives through one of these storms. We may well find this a bit surprising as the Sea of Galilee is a big lake, but it is the truth that there's something about the surrounding lands and the prevalence of high wind that make this a stormy place. Within Hebrew culture, there was also an endemic fear of water. It's no coincidence that the Old Testament is packed with sea monsters, leviathans, in case you've ever wondered. Like modern day workers in the fishing industry, many of the disciples would have had a very healthy respect for the waters they worked. They worked long before there was any real prospect of being rescued before life jackets, life rafts, and air sea rescue. I think to understand this story of the disciples in the storm at a deeper level, we need to apply the idea of storms more widely, rather than just limit it to the power of the weather. At their lowest level, storms are scary and at times life-threatening, bringing chaos and destruction in their wake and a real loss of order. We have many circumstances in our lives that fit this description, not just adverse weather conditions and natural disasters, but also bereavement, redundancy, illnesses, chronic debilitating conditions, and dare I say it, pandemics. I could go on. Difficulties in relationships and families are all can at times be really types of storm too. If you think about what they do, they can be scary, bring chaos, destruction, loss of order, and leave life feeling like it's not worth living. These modern day storms can shake us to the core, just as the original storms shook the disciples. Back in the day, in the year 2000, I was suddenly made redundant from the software company where I'd worked for over nine years. Clouds had been gathering around this organisation for some time and redundancy had been threatened a couple of times previously as the firm organised and reorganised but continued to lose money. When it came in the end, it came very, very suddenly and very decisively as the firm was engulfed by another organisation. I fell out of favour with those that wielded the power and that, as they say, was that. It felt very like the definition and purpose of my day-to-day -day existence had vanished overnight. I was put on what is described as gardening leave, so I did not do any more work, but could not start another job until that had finished, though job hunting was permitted, obviously. I discovered pretty rapidly that in the week, I didn't have much reason to get up in the morning or to do anything very much at all. Life lost its shape and coherency, I went from being enormously busy all the time to having nothing to do. I also learnt pretty graphically who my real friends were, those who rang and came round and provided moral support. And I found that the hard way, those who found excuses for not trying to help or even be in touch, justifying this by saying they didn't know what to say in the circumstances. I discovered how much we define ourselves by what we do rather than who we are as God's beloved children too. But alongside all of this, some interesting things happened. I found that I had more time to read and to pray and to walk my route of Christian discipleship. I found very great consolation in my life in the church, which was one of the few things that stayed the same. Sundays provided a great anchor point and refreshment. I established a pattern over what turned out to be just a 10 week period while I wasn't employed. Thankfully, that set me spiritually into a such a better place. And this continued after I got another job. 
It was a place and a pattern where God got much more of a look in. And I'm sure this experience, difficult though it was, helped me to follow my calling, which I was exploring at the time. And I started to train for the ministry about two years after this. Even though it was very grim at times, I was aware of Jesus in the boat in the storm of my redundancy. Through the power of the Spirit, I was never alone. Jesus was in the storm with the disciples, and I found that very consoling. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus left with us. We are never alone, even in the most difficult and stormiest of times. As fellow Christians on the journey of life, we should not be surprised by what I have just said about the Holy Spirit being with us and working us, even in those most difficult times. And yet, that is not what the world at light large might expect us to say. When I first became a Christian back in the day, there was a sense that you became a Christian and everything was going to be all right. It was perhaps the easy option, possibly even a bit of a cop-out. It was a meal ticket to happiness, or at least that was how it was portrayed. Everything in the garden was going to be rosy. Difficult times were to be a thing of the past. I'm not sure how well we've changed that wider perception, but I do think it is changing. Christianity is not a meal ticket to happiness or a guarantee for no difficult times. And as our first reading showed us with the struggles of St Paul, it certainly isn't the easy option. The wonderful things about being a Christian include massive and undeserved forgiveness for sins, God's peace and God's spirit being with us in everything, deep joy and the freedom we experience in worship. The opportunity to know Jesus through the power of the Spirit that's with us in every breath and every step. And of course, the hope of eternal life, which gives greater meaning in everything. I realise now, for example, I would much rather have my sins forgiven than be happy all the time. Likewise, I would much rather experience God's presence through the Spirit in the inner peace that brings than be happy all the time. I think it's much more honest to admit that some very bad things happen to good people. Some sad, awful and heartrending things happen to people. Things they have done nothing to, or anything like anything to deserve. Through it all, God is still with them and loves them as they are through the power of the Spirit. God still wants to use them to further his kingdom. But awful storms happen. Yet sometimes in our brokenness, in the stormiest of times, the Spirit is given more room to work in us, and this will set us free. The disciples learned from their stormy experience and had one of, mo one of the most impressive demonstrations of Jesus' love for them as he rapidly stilled the storm restored peace and calm. They went away from this incident aware in a new way of who Jesus was and how he worked. I've also known God worked through the storms in my life too, particularly through the times around my redundancy. I can see how God was with me and I was changed by the power of the Spirit working in my life and how God worked in a new and deeper way a way that in the usual busyness of my existence, I might never have given the spirit the space to dwell so richly. It's easy to look back and see the spirit working and the work being done in stormy times from a safe distance and to be thankful. It's not so easy in the midst of stormy times when it's a struggle to get up in the morning. Yet in all these times, all we can do is ask the Spirit to dwell in us richly, to get us through the day, and to be honest in our prayers about how we feel, and to be reassured that it, Jesus was in the storm with his disciples. The Holy Spirit is with us and surrounds us with God's love in everything. No, how, no matter how bleak it may appear.
As I started, I end by saying that life can be frustrating, messy and confusing. As we all experience good times and stormy bad times, storms both literal and the stormy nature of our modern lives can shake our very foundations. Then above all, we need to remember the Holy Spirit is always with us in everything as Jesus was with the disciples in the storm. Because as the chorus of that hymn goes, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Amen. So we turn now to saying the Lord's Prayer together. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And a special prayer of blessing. May God keep you in all your days. May Christ shield you in all your ways. May the Spirit bring you healing and peace. May God, the Holy Trinity, drive all darkness from you and pour upon you blessing and light. Amen. <laughs>